This is the second of two messages on the Ten Commandments. <clears throat> and let's begin by reviewing uh, the last four of the Ten Commandments. Now, as we mentioned last time, the Ten Commandments can be divided up into four that pertain to God, no other gods, no images of God, no taking of God's name in vain, remembering the Sabbath. But then the last six commandments have to do with the one's relationship with other people, honoring your father and mother, don't commit murder, don't commit adultery, don't steal, don't bear false witness, do not covet what belongs to your neighbor. We're going to concentrate on these last six commandments that pertain to our relationship with each other. I'll read the text. Honor your father and mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. The fifth of the Ten Commandments is the commandment to honor your father and mother so that you may live long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You might say that this law reflects the importance of the family and parental authority in ancient Israel, and we might uh, summarize it by saying that this law sanctifies the family. Now, this law about children obeying their parents is a primary moral command. Obedience to parents is the first moral duty a person faces in one's life. And one's attitude towards parents and parental authority can affect one's attitude towards others and societal authority generally, the police, the law, the state. Children need parents. Fatherless boys are more likely to commit crime or mistreat women. Fatherless girls are more likely to have unhealthy relationships with the wrong kind of men. A child who comes to defy parental authority is more likely to end up defying other authorities and end up uh, uh, doing things that uh, violate the other commands in the Decalogue, like stealing, adultery, murder, and false witness. So in a sense, maintaining civilization itself hinges on this command, honor your father and mother. As uh, commentator Dennis Prager says, that if you build a society in which children honor their parents, your society will long survive. The corollary is a society in which children do not honor their parents is doomed to self-destruction. The failure to learn this first moral lesson can lead to bad life outcomes. And perhaps this is why Paul calls this the first commandment with a promise that it may go well with you and that you may enjoy a long life on earth. Learning this lesson early will make for a far better, healthier, and longer life. Now, it is important to tap parental wisdom. My own generation, the baby boom generation, often repeated the slogan, don't trust anybody over 30. And that piece of advice that thought that the young and the inexperienced are wiser than their elders is the height of foolishness. Respects for, for parents allow us and our children to tap into the accumulated wisdom of the previous generation. So how do we honor our parents? Well, for younger children, <clears throat> uh, honoring father and mother is simple obedience, uh, doing what uh, the Lord, what, what your parents tell you. 
And Paul repeats it this way. He interprets the command, children, obey your parents in the Lord, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. But throughout our life, even when we are no longer children and obligated to obey our parents, we should continue to give our parents respect. Now, our relationship with our parents will change over time. In Genesis 2.24, it says, uh, For this cause a man will leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. When one marries, one leaves, in a sense, your father and mother, <clears throat> in the sense of they are no longer your first priority in life. Your, your spouse will become your first priority after marriage. <clears throat> but even though that, uh, that verse says that we are to leave our father and mother in that sense, uh, we should still show them honor as parents even though, again, obedience is only when we are children under their authority. Now, I have to admit that when I was uh, in college, I was disrespectful to my parents. And to make it worse, it was after I became a Christian that I became that way. I mean, after all, what did they know? They were unsaved. They had failed me in many ways when I was young. Uh, when I'd gone through loneliness and despair as a teenager, they, they didn't seem to have any solution for that. And sadly, for a while, and I regret to say this, I didn't show them much respect after I became a Christian, even though they had done the best that they knew how to be parents. And that leads us to another way that we can honor our parents, and that's by forgiveness. What about really bad parents? Maybe you had a parent who was not a very good parent. Maybe they were abusive, irresponsible, neglectful. In the worst case, they might have even abandoned you. But remember that every parent makes mistakes, even you have if you have become a parent. And most of us bear scars from our childhood from parental mistakes. But remember that even flawed parents have loved you, have cared for you, have sacrificed much for you. What do you owe your parents? Well, only life ex itself, your very existence. And so one way we can honor our parents is by overlooking and forgiving their faults and insofar as it's possible on our end to maintain some kind of a relationship with them, even if they are deeply flawed human beings. Even if it's hard to have an affection for a emotionally abusive parent, it's still possible to honor them, honor them for their office as parent and not necessarily for them as human beings. Remember this too, that if you don't honor your parents, you can't expect your grandchildren and your children to honor you. We can also honor our parents by inclusion. That is by including them in our daily lives, keeping in touch with them, visiting them, even if they seem hopelessly behind the times or even if they're failing mentally, we can honor them by including them in our lives. And God will bless us if we do that. We also honor our parents later in life by taking care of them in their old age. One of the duties of children, especially in Old Testament times, was to care for parents when they became too old to care for themselves. In Old Testament times, there was no social security or nursing homes. One's children were one's social security and caregivers in old age. In fact, Jesus rebukes the Pharisees for their rules that made it impossible for sons to fulfill their obligation of caring for their parents as they grew old. As it says in Mark chapter 7, verses 10 through 13, for Moses said, honor your father and mother, and anyone who curses their father and mother is to be put to death. But you say that if anyone declares that what might have been used to help their father and mother is korban, that is devoted to God, 
then you no longer let them do anything for their father and mother, and thus you nullify the word of God by your tradition that you have handed down, and you do many things like that. Out of the Pharisaic religious tradition, you could dedicate your money to God in a way that would not allow you to help your parents when they became too old to take care of themselves. But that was contradicting, Jesus says, the commandment to honor your father and mother. Modern American culture would do well to learn from ancient Israel in honoring parents. Let me move on to the next command. Oh, by the way, uh, that Jesus quotes the verse in, Deuteron in Exodus uh, 21 and verse 15 that says, whoever strikes, I think the sense of it is beats up his father and mother, is to be put to death. And likewise, whoever curses, which probably means repudiating, his father and mother uh, is to be put to death. Uh, they took very seriously the obligation to honor parents uh, uh, throughout life and uh, even made it a capital offense to, to beat up your parents or to uh, curse, uh, to repudiate them in the sense of not taking care of them as they grow older. The sixth commandment, do not commit murder. This commandment sanctifies human life. Now, it's been misapplied, especially with the King James translation of it, uh, you shall not kill. Uh, it's been misapplied to killing of other sorts that doesn't really relate. For example, the slaughtering of animals for food. Some would say, well, thou shalt not kill, and therefore you can't do that. that uh, but that was uh, specifically uh, made permissible back in Genesis chapter 9 and verse 3, that it was okay to take animal life for food. Uh, it also does not exclude war. God in the Old Testament commands Israel to conduct war against the Canaanites. It also does not exclude capital punishment. In fact, as we've seen in Exodus 21, uh, there are several capital offenses that are mentioned, including beating up and abandoning your parents. Now, we should note that there are different degrees of murder that the Bible contemplates. <clears throat> there is deliberate and premeditated murder. This is mentioned in Genesis uh, 9 and verse 6. Uh, Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man his blood shall be shed, for God made man in his own image. In other words, because human beings are made in the image of God, attacking a human being and killing them is akin to attacking God, and therefore it's made a capital offense. And that's repeated in Exodus 21, verse 12, whoever strikes a man so that he dies shall be put to death. And also verse 14, but if a man willfully attacks another to kill him by cunning, you shall take him from my altar that he may die. Deliberate and premeditated murder was punishable in the Old Testament law by death. On the other hand, unintentional or negligent manslaughter was not. In Numbers chapter 35, it says, uh, but if he pushed him suddenly without enmity or hurled anything on him without lying in wait or used uh, a stone that uh, could cause death without seeing him, dropped it on him so that he died, though he was not his enemy and did not seek his harm, well, then the congregation shall judge between the manslayer and the avenger of blood in accordance with these rules. And the congregation shall rescue the manslayer from the hand of the avenger of blood. You, you see, if you unintentionally killed someone, you were to flee to the city of refuge and there would be a trial. And if they determined it was intentional murder, well, then you would uh, be executed. But if they determined it was unintentional or accidental manslaughter, uh, well, then you might be punished. In fact, you were. You were, had to stay in the city of refuge until the death of the high priest, but that was not a capital offense. Not all taking of human life is of, uh, are equally uh, heinous. Uh, the one is a capital offense, but unintentional negligent manslaughter is not. 
What about abortion? Is abortion of a healthy developing fetus a violation of this command against murder, as many Christians think? And this, of course, depends on at what point the fetus becomes a human person. Is it at the fertilization of the egg that a human personhood begins? Or at the implantation into the uterus? Or when the first heart beats? Or the uh, brain waves begin? And uh, where you think human personhood begins will affect your interpretation as to whether or not uh, this uh, particular uh, thing is uh, a violation of the sixth commandment. Uh, speaking only for myself, it seems clear to me that when you get to the third trimester where the baby could live outside the mother, uh, that uh, taking uh, a healthy life at that point without any uh, medical reason to do so uh, is uh, purely murder and a violation of this command is a little less clear at the beginning of the process. Though, again, speaking only for myself, uh, I would use the analogy, if you, if you don't know when human personhood begins, you should give the benefit of the doubt to the fetus, for you don't want to blow up a building if there's any possibility that anybody is in there. Well, on this command against murder, Jesus uh, gets to the heart of the matter by explaining that, well, if anybody is angry with his brother, then he is subject to judgment. And so you've heard it said, you shall not commit murder, but even anger is contrary to the spirit of this command. You might say that the underlying uh, spirit and principle of this law is that behavior and attitudes that are destructive of life are implicitly condemned by this law against uh, murder, murderous thoughts, in insulting words. Uh, they too uh, can be uh, a violation of the spirit of this law, or to put it positively, uh, our attitudes and actions should promote life not death and destruction. Let me move on to the seventh commandment. You shall not commit adultery. This sanctifies the marriage covenant. Adultery is actively unbecoming of those in a covenant relationship with God. And in the Old Testament, it was uh, potentially a capital offense as is mentioned in Deuteronomy 22 and verse 22. Uh, there were exceptions to it. If there were no witnesses, uh, then there would be an exception. Uh, if there was uh, mercy on the part of uh, the offended party, the husband, uh, he could spare both his wife and her, uh, her lover uh, if he wanted to. Uh, Joseph was an example of that when he found out that uh, Mary was pregnant, even though he wasn't the father. Uh, he uh, purposed to divorce her quietly rather than put her to public shame. Um, that was uh, uh, mercy on the part of Joseph and not uh, car carrying out the full extent of the law. Uh, likewise, God had mercy on Israel, according to Jeremiah 3 and verse 8, who uh, metaphorically was God's wife. And uh, rather than executing her as the law allows, he gave her a certificate of divorce and sent her away. You can read about that in Jeremiah 3 and verse 8. And Proverbs says that, well, another way you might escape was by paying a ransom. Although it does warn the young men, don't commit adultery because the husband won't accept a ransom, in which case you could end up dead. Now, there was a rather different penalty in the case of sexual relations between the unmarried. Uh, according to uh, Exodus 22, 16 and 17, if a man seduces a virgin who is not betrothed and lies with her, he shall give the bride price for her and make, him, uh, make her uh, his wife. But if uh, her father utterly refuses to give her to him, uh, he shall pay the money equal to the bride price for virgins. Now, this would be discouraging for irresponsible sexual behavior in Israel. 
because uh, a man could end up uh, getting a wife that he didn't want, or he might not get the wife that he wanted and, and lose the bride price or the dowry that he has to pay to the father as a, as a penalty. Uh, so either way, he might lose. Um, and uh, on the other hand, if they kind of just jumped the gun, as it were, and uh, got the cart in front of the horse, uh, the father could just agree, well, go ahead and get married since you can't control yourself. And, um, and that would uh, uh, take care of, care of the matter. Uh, but notice that even though this is uh, a irresponsible and condemned sexual activity, uh, it was not punishable by death. It was only, well, in this case, it was punishable by marriage or else a fine. And I might apply this to people just living together. Well, scripture discourages that kind of irresponsible behavior. The solution to it is, well, why don't you just go ahead and get married? Now, Jesus too uh, gets to the heart of the matter in this law about adultery. Infidelity is a fundamental violation of the marriage covenant, often destroys marriages major cause of the breakup of marriages is in fact uh, an adulterous affair because that will cause the partner to feel angry, rejected and find it hard to ever trust you again. And this is, the fact that this is so damaging is perhaps the reason why uh, the New Testament in Jesus's words uh, allows adultery as a grounds for divorce in Matthew 19 and verse nine. Jesus says, I say to you, whoever divorces his wife, except for sexual immorality and marries another, commits adultery. Uh, it discourages, uh, you know, just divorcing people and marrying another. That's the moral equivalent of adultery. Uh, but it does allow it in the case of the fundamental violation of uh, the marriage covenant by the uh, offending party that on those cases, it was allowed to divorce and remarry. But Jesus also goes on to say that even looking lustfully at another man's wife is to have committed adultery in your heart, Matthew 5, 27 through 30. And when he says, uh, you know, you've heard it said, do not commit adultery, but I say to you, even looking lustfully at another man's wife, he's committed adultery in his heart. He's not really contradicting this commandment against adultery, uh, but getting to the heart and spirit of the command. And indeed, in the Ten Commandments itself, it has essentially the same thing when it says, do not covet your neighbor's wife. Let's move on to the Tenth Commandment, the command against theft. You shall not steal. And this command respect, uh, sanctifies respect for property. The Bible is unlike Marxism, which uh, doesn't believe in private property. The Bible assumes the validity of the principle of private property and protects it by law. You might remember recently in the Antifa and Black Lives Matter riots that some people justified some of the uh, vandalism that was done by saying, well, it's just property. But destroying people's property is a form of theft and would be condemned by the spirit of this law. So I think they got it right that there is a difference between property and people. And even in the theft law, the Bible does make that distinction. The Bible never makes ordinary theft a capital offense. And this is unlike Mesopotamian law that uh, if you uh, stole something from somebody, you, a, as much as 30-fold restitution could be demanded. And if you couldn't pay, you could be executed. But the Bible never makes ordinary theft a capital offense. Uh, if you do steal, well, uh, well, the rules are if you steal uh, uh, objects, uh, you had to pay back twofold restitution, that is double the value of what you stole. If you steal an animal, you had to pay fourfold for the sheep and fivefold uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for the ox. And uh, 
the worst thing that could happen to you if you couldn't pay, you might end up being sold into servitude for six years. Now, of course, there's lots of different ways you can steal. A schoolgirl can steal answers on an exam from a neighbor. A college student can steal a term paper from something found online and turn it in as his own work. A worker can sneak company property uh, out of the building and not return it. We can all cheat on our taxes and that would be a form of theft as well. So again, it's a, a primary moral, moral command, thou shalt not steal. Ninth command, you shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. Now, the original application is uh, the courtroom setting. In fact, the wording of it suggests that you, you shall not answer with a false testimony against your neighbor. It's like you're being asked questions in, in a legal setting and you're not to uh, answer falsely. So uh, the original application of it, the concrete one is perjury in court. And indeed, the Bible in Deuteronomy 19, 16 through 21 says, well, the penalty for perjury in court is whatever it is that you were trying to get uh, the man you're lying about condemned to uh, should be applied to you. So if it's a capital crime and you accuse him of murder of somebody uh, and it's proven that you lied, well, you could be executed for trying to get the other guy executed by falsely accusing him. And this, by the way, is a very common problem, even in our courts uh, today. Well-known uh, Harvard professor Alan Dersowicz uh, states that on the basis of my academic and professional experience, I believe no felony is committed more frequently in this country than the genre of perjury and false statements. Perjury during civil dispositions, uh, depositions and, and trials is so endemic that a respected appellate judge once observed that experienced lawyers say that in large cities, scarcely a trial occurs in which some witness does not lie. But even if the original application was into a courtroom setting, it does uh, have a broader application in applying to all kinds of falsehoods. That can be slander, that can be malicious gossip, it can be all kinds of lies uh, because uh, we as believers should be people that are uh, ones that affirm the truth. And that would be going along with the character of God. God is true, he doesn't lie as various verses in Old and New Testament uh, says. He wants the righteous to put aside all falsehood and speak truth from the heart. We should live according to what the New Testament calls the gospel of truth. This command against bearing false witness, in effect, sanctifies the truth. And then we come to the 10th commandment. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his manservant or maidservant, his ox, his donkey, or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Coveting is desiring what does not belong to you or that which you have no right to. And so envy and greed are examples of coveting in this sense. So is infatuation towards another spouse, as we've already mentioned. And this sin is a very destructive sin. This attitude of desiring what doesn't belong to you or desiring that which you have no right uh, can be very, very harmful. You know, we're coming up with to Thanksgiving and we're supposed to count our blessings and be thankful. It's going to be hard during this time of COVID. But envy keeps us from appreciating what we do have by concentrating on what we don't have. By concentrating what others have that we don't, it robs us of joy. And yet, you know, this sin can sometimes feel like a virtue. Certain lines of political thought, in fact, encourages us to be envious and jealous, say, of the rich, of the millionaires and billionaires who allegedly don't pay their fair share. And this can feel virtuous. And in some cases, it may be true that they don't pay their fair share. 
But I think in most cases, it's just the politics of envy that tries to make the sin feel virtuous for political ends. Indeed, envy encourages us to hate the one with whom we are envious. Paul tells us that love does not envy, 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 4. Envy, coveting, is incompatible with love. This command that uh, tells us to uh, not covet is not a law in the ordinary sense. There's no civil penalty for coveting. It's an internal feeling, and the law really can't uh, judge internal feelings and, and, and uh, punish you for uh, that. In that sense, it's a spiritual command rather than something that can be enforced. And, uh, but Jesus does uh, tell us that this command can be enforced, that if we covet what doesn't belong to us, uh, it's enforced by God. Uh, the law is a spiritual thing and not just an external norm. And as Jesus says about uh, coveting your neighbor's wife, even the thought life comes under the judgment of God. You might say this law against coveting sanctifies the heart. Now, how can you avoid evil thoughts like this? Well, Luther uh, put it this way. Uh, he used the analogy, well, uh, you can't keep birds from flying around your head, but you certainly can keep them from building a nest there. And so it is with coveting. Well, you can't keep the thought maybe from coming into your head, but you don't have to let it make a home there. You know, shoo it off. Uh, thou shalt not covet. Well, let's come to the end and and look at the significance of these things. Commandments uh, 5 through 10 is a guide to Christian living. Tells us the kind of people that God wants us to be. He, want us, he wants us to be people who from childhood and our relationship with our parents learn to accept, accept authorities that God has set over us. He wants us to sanctify human life and seek towards enhancing life rather than causing death. He wants us to be faithful to our spouses and responsible in our sexual expressions. He wants us to respect other people's property, both material and intellectual. He wants us to be honest in our uh, dealings, uh, whether testifying in court or anywhere else. He wants his people to control their thought lives so that we don't envy or inappropriately desire what doesn't belong to us. But the law also shows us to be sinners, for we have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. As we go through these commandments one by one, we find that we fall short, if not of the letter of the law, at least of the ideal as Jesus expands upon them. Who of us haven't disobeyed our parents as a child? Some of us may fail to honor them as adults. Maybe we've never murdered anybody, but we've killed with a look. We've had murderous anger in our hearts. And Jesus says that makes us guilty enough to go to hell. Matthew 5, 22. And even if we haven't committed adultery, we have committed adultery in our fantasies, violated the spirit of this law against adultery. And uh, we have from time to time taken things that haven't belonged to us, whether by shoplifting or cheating on taxes or even downloading loading and playing copyrighted material or movies without permission. And we may not have lied in court, but we've lied and distorted the truth to each other countless times and countless ways. And while we not ought not to covet and envy others, we often do. By recognizing these things, it shows that we are sinners deserving God's judgment. Paul says it worked that way in his life in Romans uh, chapter 7, and verses uh, 7 through 12. 
what shall we say? Is the law sin? By no means. And yet, had it not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet if the law had not said, you shall not covet it. But sin, seizing the opportunity through the commandment, produced in me all kinds of covetousness. For apart from the law, sin lies dead. But once I was alive, once I was alive apart from the law, but when the command came, sin came alive and I died. The very commandment that promised life proved to be death to me, for sin seizing an opportunity through the commandment deceived me and through it killed me. And so the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. In other words, he realized he was a sinner. Um, he was not held accountable when he didn't know that he was sinning. But now that he knows and goes ahead and does it, well, he is guilty before God and he needs a savior. And of course, that is why Jesus came. He came to be uh, the substitute for our sins, to uh, uh, be the one that dies in our place so that uh, sin could be punished in him instead of in us. The law can be a guide for Christian living, but it's not a way of establishing a relationship with God. Rather, the law shows us to be sinners in the need of God's grace and forgiveness. But that only comes through the death of Jesus Christ, who died for our sins and took the penalty for our sins upon himself so that we might be forgiven. Pray to the Lord. Lord, thank you for dying for my sins fulfilling the law that I could not fulfill, taking the penalty that I deserved. Come, I believe and trust that you died for me on the cross and be my savior. Pray that and the Lord will welcome you into the family of God.